Our scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We see here in Luke 15 that Jesus has had yet another confrontation with the Pharisees, the righteous leaders of Israel who could not be bothered with tax collectors and sinners, who pointed their fingers and said, I'm glad I'm not like them. I can't hang around them. I don't want to be with them because they're just wrong. And Jesus looks at them and begins to teach them about God's love and what God's love encompasses. And he teaches them several parables. We're going to look at the three here in Luke 15 today. And he starts with this one about the lost sheep. About the shepherd that has a flock of 100 sheep. And one of them just sort of wanders off. And gets lost. And can't find his way back home. So the shepherd goes out, leaves the 99 where they are because they're the righteous sheep. They don't wander off. And he goes looking for this one lost little sheep. He looked wherever he can, wherever he thinks he can find it. And eventually does find it and picks it up and carries it back to the fold and rejoices with everyone. Saying, look, I found my lost sheep. Isn't that wonderful? And the lost sheep is returned to the fold. Now God is, of course, that shepherd. And the sheep is a sinner. The one that he loves. But there's another side to that story that Jesus doesn't say. See, God rejoices and all of heaven rejoices when a sinner is found. But every now and then, the shepherd doesn't find the sheep in time. The wolves do. This world will destroy us. The Bible tells us that Satan rolls around like a roaring lion looking for those he may devour. <coughs> Many years ago, back in the early 90s, I worked for Bank of America in downtown Charlotte. Right at Trade and Triangle in the Independence Center. The complex there had a Marriott Hotel. And I had to go somewhere for work. And as I left, I was standing there on the corner. In the morning, I saw something on there. Forget it. See, a man had gone to the top of the Marriott 20 stories up and thrown himself off. And what I saw was a body under a cover. But it didn't cover everything. And it was an ugly sight. I don't know exactly why or what it was, but I could swear that when I looked over there at that body, 
that was covered with that blue tarp. That there was a shepherd there kneeling and weeping because one of his sheep was lost. You know, God loves everyone. <coughs> and when one of them is lost and does not get found in time, there's no rejoicing God to Christ. God is searching for lost sheep. And if he finds them, he rejoices. But if it's too late, he cries. The next parable Jesus tells is about a woman. We don't know that much about her, but based off the fact that she appears to live alone, She's probably somewhat older, maybe even a widow. And she has 10 silver coins, which probably amounts to entire life savings, that which she has to live on. And one of them gets lost. We don't know how, but you know how easy it is to lose something. But think about this, she has just lost 10% of her possessions, her wealth, that which she had to live on. How would you feel if you suddenly lost 10% of everything you had? That would be devastating. It would put you in a very great bind. Well, the woman take steps to try and find it. The first thing she does is she gets a light and shines it through the house, hoping, just hoping, that the light can be held in just the right spot so that she sees that little reflection off the silver. She starts looking under things, under the chairs, under the tables, under the cabinets. She starts sweeping up the dirt and dust, hoping to uncover it. And after doing all that, she finds it. And she rejoices. She cleans it up. And she's got it. She tells all her friends and neighbors that she found that which was lost, that which was of value to her, that which sustained her. God, of course, was that woman. And sinners are those that he's looking for, that he turns on the light for. The light of the world is Jesus. And he sent that light into the world so that sinners could find it and could come to it so that they could be seen. And he does what is necessary to clean up around them, to clean them off so that they can be brought into his presence. So that something that is of value to him can be restored to him. Something of great value value you God doesn't stop looking for that which is lost and when it's returned he rejoices and all of heaven rejoices with them the last parable in Luke 15 is one many of you are familiar with I'm sure it's the parable of the prodigal son now, there are some differences between this parable and the other two. In the other two, the sheep and the coin got lost. Probably through no act of their own necessarily. They just sort of got mishandled, got straight away, not on purpose, not deliberately. But the prodigal son is different. The prodigal son does what he does on purpose. He's disrespectful to his father by saying, I want what's mine now. I want to take it. Don't hold it for me. I can't wait for you to die. I want it now. So the father splits up the inheritance. Now, the tradition at the time was that the older brother would get twice what the younger did. So the younger brother got one third of the estate all at once. 
The father gives it to him and lets him go his way. And the father does not go looking for him. Because, you know, sometimes you just have to let someone choose their way and make their own mistakes in life until they get so bad that they fall into the depths before they turn around. And the father knows that about his son, so he lets him go. And the son takes it, every bit of it, and wastes it on what the Bible says is wild living. Now you know what wild living is. Lying, living, and song. Having a good time, partying with your friends until he uses it all up. And he winds up with nothing. And then a famine comes and things get tough. Now, I don't know how many of you like the blues, but there's an old blues song that this kid really found out about. It's called Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out. When you got everything, people flock to you. When you got nothing, they desert you. And that's exactly what happened. He was in a foreign land. He'd been partying and having fun with a lot of friends. But when the money ran out, the friends disappeared. And he was left on his own. And he wound up hiring himself out as a slave. Eating pigs. And he got hungry. Because there was a famine. And he wasn't even allowed to eat remnants of the slop that the pigs were given. That he had to put before them. And I like what the Bible says here in verse 17. When he came to his senses, he had sunk to the depths. He had gotten to the bottom. And he knew that there was no way to go but up. And he knew where he had to go to do it. How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. See, hitting the bottom is sometimes the only way to break someone of pride. For them to find out what it means to be humble. For what it means to say, I can't do this. I'm going in the wrong direction and I need to return. And the son does that. He understands that the only way he's going to survive is to go back to the father. But he knows that he can't go back with the same position that he had. He's no longer worthy to be a son. He's been humbled to the point that he says, just make me a slave in your house so that I can have what I need to live on. Let me just live here and serve you. So he got up and went to his father. Now put yourself in the father's position. Here's your son, your youngest son, who's wandered off, who's gone off on his own, and you haven't heard from him in this whole time. And chances are there were some bitter words when he left. And your heart is breaking. Here's a father that has been looking for his son to return, hoping for some news, some good news. He's probably sat looking out the window day after day after day, hoping to see some glimpse of his son coming back down the road. And then one day, he looks out, and there he sees his son. He looks a lot different because he's poor and disheveled. And what does he do? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The father sees the son coming and is so full of compassion that he can't contain himself any longer. And he runs down the road to meet his son and is passionately embracing him with so much joy and love 
that he can't contain himself. The Father accepts him just as he is. He knows what's going on. He can tell by looking at him that his son has changed. Well, what is in the past is in the past. And he looks at him and unconditionally loves him. And sees the son humbling himself. And the son says, I am not worthy to be called your son. Let me just be a servant. And what does the father do? He calls one of his servants and has the best robe put on, puts a ring on his finger and tells the servant, let's kill the fatty calf and let's celebrate because the one that was lost is found. He once was dead and is now alive. And he welcomes them back. You know, he couldn't help himself because of his great love for his son. When Jesus continues the story, he talks about the older son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. I don't know how many of you have younger siblings. I've got three. I can't imagine that type of response. To be so angry about it that your brother who has gone off and is now back and is still alive and is back in the family. I can't imagine being so angry that you would not even go in to greet him. Well, that's what the older brother does. See, the older brother is just as lost as the younger brother was. He has stayed around. Yes, he's done the work, but he says it. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The other older brother is just as lost, if not more so, because he sees himself as righteous. But he's just as much of a sinner. The father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate me glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We don't know what the other older brother did after that. We don't know if he came, finally came to his senses and came in and greeted his brother and celebrated or if he stormed off in a fit of jealous rage. But the father loves both of them. You know, Jesus preached these parables to the crowd around him, and especially to the Pharisees. But it is as if he is standing here today preaching those same parables to us. Where do you fit in these parables? Are you one of the lost sheep who just sort of wandered off and Jesus worked and sent somebody to find you and bring you back into the fold? Are you that valuable lost coin that somehow or another you finally saw the light and got turned around and brought back valued as you are? 
to God's family. Are you that prodigal son who deliberately picked to go off? And sink down until finally you got to the bottom and realized that you had to go a different direction, that you had to go back to the Father. Are you that Father who knew how to show compassion, who had unconditional love, so that anyone who came back to you? Would be welcomed passionately with rejoicing and celebration. Or are you that older son? The one who can't accept rejoicing for a lost sinner. You know, everybody has a favorite sin. Now it's not that sin that you enjoy committing, it's that sin that you can't take, that you point fingers at, say, I'm so glad I'm not like that. I never did anything like that. And we have a tendency to look at people like that without the compassion and love that God does. We can't accept them as they are. There was a pastor I knew larger church had an associate pastor that had his own ministry in the seedier part of town ministering to drug addicts to the homeless to prostitutes and there was one prostitute that saw the light because of what he was doing that turned her life around and came to Christ and started going to church and then began working with this associate, going back over there to the seedy part of town in order to reach others that had been like her, to bring them to Christ. They developed a relationship. And eventually they developed love. And this associate pastor, pastor to marry him. And boy, did the tongue start wagging then. They were okay with her coming and going to church, but to think that she had the audacity to marry a pastor because she'd been a prostitute? It got so bad that the associate pastor stood up in front of the church one day and said, look, this woman has been made holy and righteous by God. Everything in her past has been forgiven. She is a new person. You should accept her the same way. There is no problem with my marrying her. And I will do that because I see who she is now in Christ. You know, we tend to forget that there is no sinner that is so awful that God does not love them and want to save them. There is no sinner who is so bad that Jesus did not die for them. As Christians, those who follow Jesus, we are called to love like Christ did. In fact, Christ says that a new commandment he gives to us, that you love one another, that the world will know that we are Christians because of the love we have for one another. There is no one here who doesn't have a tainted past, who hasn't been lost in sin, but hasn't been found and saved through Christ and made holy and righteous. We as Christians are required to show the same compassion as God does for those who are saved as sinners. We are required to celebrate every repentant sinner who comes to Jesus. And that celebration 
How many of you have celebrated the birth of a new child into your family? A baby. You can't help but celebrate that. That's the type of celebration we're supposed to have when a sinner is born again in Christ Jesus. They are like a new baby. Welcome into our family as our brother and sister in Christ. Join heirs with us in the kingdom of God. We have to welcome them as we would a baby into Jesus. And when that baby comes, we love them without reservation, without condition. We just love them. And that's what Jesus tells us to do for those who come to him. Because that's what he does. See, they are saved from sin just as we are through the blood of Christ on the cross. We have to remember that we too were lost and are now found that we too were dead, but are now alive. So we should rejoice, just as all the angels in heaven do for one sinner that comes to Christ. We should rejoice with them any time a sinner chooses a different life and chooses to turn themselves around. Because it is a time to celebrate. To know that you now have a new brother, a new sister in Christ that you're going to get to spend eternity with, celebrating and rejoicing before God, the Creator, who sent His Son to die for each one of us. See, we are called by God. First, to come to Christ in repentance and humility. And then to celebrate for all those who come as well. Our family is growing every time a sinner comes to Jesus and repents. And that is showing off reason to celebrate. Because when you came, there was a celebration. someone else comes there's a celebration and we get to partake in that ain't that great amen